This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Right, we're now going to look at the chapter on discounted cash flow. And um, there'll never be an exam uh, without a major bit of discounting involved. Um, you've seen, or you should have seen, um, <coughs> basic discounted cash flow in uh, the earlier financial management exam, or whatever you did at university if you were exempt. Uh, and the basic idea is exactly the same, um, but there are some extra things um, necessary, often in this exam. So what I'm going to do, there's a lot to cover in this chapter, so I'm not going to have one enormously long lecture. We'll break it down into uh, several parts. But first of all, uh, let me um, effectively revise with you um, the basic discounted cash flow, the net present value calculations from the earlier exam, uh, and remind you of the what you might call rules. And then I'll gradually make it a bit more interesting, bringing in a few extra tricks and calculations that could be needed in this advanced exam. But uh, again, there'll always be discounting. It may be as it was in the earlier exam, simply appraising a new project. Uh, it may be that you're thinking of taking over a company and you need to value the company using discounted cash flow. It may be that you're setting up a new operation in a foreign country, which brings in extra complications, but the basic idea always is the same. Uh, and on uh, the first page of the note, um, I've listed the main things we need to watch for, so I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, I'll remind you with an example, but appreciate it's cash flows we're looking at, and only cash flows. Non-cash flows are not relevant. Uh, it's future cash flows, so if we've already spent money, that's too bad. It, it's irrelevant. It's whatever future cash flows and future incremental, future extra cash flows will be to the company of doing this project. Uh, almost certainly in the exam there'll be inflation, which has a bit more arithmetic, as I'll remind you again in a second. Uh, equally, there's almost certain to be tax involved, which in itself isn't hard, but there's yet one more thing to worry about. Uh, and working capital, which again on its own is very easy, but an extra little complication. So you have a lot of things to worry about uh, in, you know, in, in one question, very, very often, question one of the exam. Anyway, to remind you what I meant by all of that and to revise the basic project appraisal before we look at extra things, look at um, the first example, example one on the next page. And if you have a quick read with me first, Rome PLC is considering buying a new machine in order to produce a new product. Uh, we then told the cost, it's going to last five years, it'll have a scrap value. Uh, they've told us we're going to produce 100,000 units a year, and we're given there the selling price, we're given the production costs, but there's inflation. Materials inflating at 8% a year, labour at 5% a year. There's another expense mentioned, fixed overheads. We expect to be able to increase the selling price of the product. We'll need extra working capital. And there's tax at the bottom. There are capital allowances. I'll remind you how we deal with it, what it is when we come to it. And there's tax payable immediately of 25%. So even though this is a very basic one, uh, lots of little things we need to worry about. And of course the cost of capital here we've given is 10%. In a full exam question, that will be extra work. You'll have to calculate the cost of capital yourself. But we've already looked at that in the earlier chapters. So I'm not going to waste more time here. So here I've told you what the cost of capital is. However, let's make a start and watch the approach, because even though I did, did mention there can be a few extra complications, the basic approach is always the same. First of all, look at the time period. The second line tells us it will last for five years. 
And so best lay it, is to lay it out the way the examiner does. It makes it easier for the markers. Have columns uh, for each 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, leave space. You may remember, and I'll remind you why later, there may be occasions you need a sixth year. I'll say I'll remind you why later, but leave space just in case. Now we need to, one by one, start listing the various cash flows. And always, first of all, list what we call the operating flows. Uh, which are your profit and loss type items, your revenue and your expenses. So let's go through, first of all, the sales revenue. Uh, the question tells us we expect to produce 100,000 units per year. And it tells us, fourth line, they'll be sold for $20 per unit in the first year. So how much will we receive in the first year? Uh, where are we? 100,000 units. Uh, $20. So in total, the cash receipt will be two million. Now in exam, never ever work to the nearest dollar. We'll be writing zeros all over the place. It wastes time, it wastes paper. Um, do things, there's no rule here, but here I'll do things to the nearest thousand, on occasions maybe even to the nearest million. But if I do everything to the nearest thousand, um, the actual revenue is two million. To the nearest thousand, it's going to be what? Uh, 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 two thousand. There is the actual cash receipt in the first year. Now, do get clear about the timing. Some people get awfully muddled up. Those zero, one, two, three are not year zero, year one, year two, even though the examiner tends to write that at the top in his answers, which is very confusing. They are points in time that are a year apart. So time zero is now, it's today. Time one is one year from now. The end of our first year of trading or the beginning of the second year. Time two is two years from now. The end of the second year of trading, beginning of the third year and so on. And we always assume unless you're told differently that these operating flows occur at the ends of years. So whereas in real life that two million presumably be receiving throughout the year, we assume always that we receive it at the end of the year and therefore the receipt is in one year's time, time one. However, let's carry on. We'll carry on having receipts each year, but it does tell us further down the question, we expect to increase the selling price of the product by 7%. And so although, quite specifically, we sell for $20 per unit in the first year, we receive actual cash of 2000 In the second year, it'll have gone up by 7%. To add on 7%, Multiply by 1.07, uh, which gives us a receipt of 2140. And similarly, each year it carries on inflating. And so multiply by 1.07 again. And in the third year, we get 2290. Remember, I'm doing to the nearest thousand. Bits of rounding in the exam are irrelevant. Uh, but in the third year, a fourth year, another 1.07 brings it up to 2450. And in the fifth year, 2622. Don't keep showing loads of workings here because the volume stays the same at 100,000 units. We just multiply by 1.07 each year. That little bit of workings there has made it clear what I'm trying to do. 
It's obvious to the marker, I'll still get marks even if my arithmetic went wrong. Uh, but that's sufficient. Of course, one way they could make it, I was going to say more complicated, it's not more complicated, but extra work, is if the volume changed. If I told you in the third year, uh, we were going to produ production and go up to 200,000 units. Then, of course, you'd have to recalculate 200,000 units at $20 with two years inflation. It wouldn't be harder, but clearly it adds more time. However, here, no problem. There is the revenue. Uh, what about the costs? Well, first of all, we've got materials. Uh, $8 a unit. Inflating below at 8% per annum, but the wording's a bit different. It says at current prices. And be clear what that means. You see, we haven't even bought this machine yet. Uh, we need to estimate what the cash flows will be. And perhaps we've rung the suppliers. And they've told us that at the moment, we'll have to pay $8 for materials. However, we're not buying any yet. We won't be buying any until next year when we've actually got the machine. And by next year, it will have gone up. And how much will it cost us next year? There's 100,000 units. It's $8 a unit, but if that's the current price, by next year when we buy it, it will be 8% higher. The actual cost next year, we estimate, uh, again, working in thousands, will be 864. It's an outflow we're paying 864. And do check the wording of the question carefully. If the question says the flows are at current prices, then at time one, there'll be a year's inflation in a minute, at time two, two years' inflation, and so on. But see the difference from the revenue. The revenue didn't say anything about current prices. It said we would sell for 20 in the first year. And so the first year's revenue, the cash was 2,000. However, let's carry on. Uh, the materials, again, the volume stays the same. And so each year the total cost will simply inflate. Each year we'll multiply by 1.08 for 8% inflation. So time two. It's 933. At time 3, another 8% is 1008. At time 4, uh, 1088. Uh, and at time 5, 1175. So in isolation, easy enough. Uh, and in fact, as long as you're laying it out nicely, that's one nice thing about that present value calculations, however easy or hard the whole question is, is that of course each line is marked separately. So even if you get one bit wrong, there's still plenty of other marks you should have been able to get. Uh, similarly, labour. Labour is $7 a unit, but again it's at current prices and is inflating at 5%. And so the first year's flow. 100,000 units, uh, 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 $7. But because it's at current prices, the first flow at time one will be 5% higher, which means an expense of 735 at time one. And then again, each year multiplied by 1.05 to inflate. So, 772-810-851, and finally, 893. Am I getting it right? Yes. Sorry, I, I want to check because... If I make one silly arithmetic mistake, everything goes wrong, and I'm going to have to record this all over again. 
Uh, but so far, I think everything's correct. And I trust you're doing it with me and checking me. Anything else? Well, there's one more expense mentioned. It says fixed overheads of the company currently amount to a million. And the management accountant has decided that 20% of these should be absorbed into the new product. Now be very careful here, and again, read a question carefully. What we are after is what extra costs will there be if we do this project. Now the fixed overheads are currently a million, that's fine, no problem. The question is, are we going to spend any more than a million doing this project? The management accountants decided that 20% of this million should be absorbed into the new product. Well, for profit purposes, the fixed overheads can be charged to our various products in any way we want. But we're not interested in profits here. We're not doing profit calculations. We're looking at cash flows. And we're only interested in these fixed overheads if we'll end up having to spend more. If the question had told me, oh, doing this project will need extra overheads of 100,000 a year, that would be relevant. But it doesn't. That wording Absorbing simply means charging for profit purposes. On that wording, the total overheads for the company will stay the same at a million. There's no extra cost. And therefore, it's not relevant for this question. So where are we? We've now got, if I net them off, the net operating cash flow each year. So... Let's do it, 2,000 minus 864 minus 735. I get 401 at time one. At time two, and at 435. At time three, four seven two. At time four, Five one one, and finally at time five, uh, two six two two minus one one seven five minus eight nine three, five five four. Okay, so far so good, but of course there's an extra cash flow in that there's going to be tax payable on the profits. Tells me at the bottom, tax twenty five percent. However, we've got capital allowances. Capital allowances or tax allowable depreciation means the same thing. It means when we come to calculate tax, <coughs> we are allowed to subtract from the operating profit. We're allowed to subtract the depreciation. Now, you may remember from the earlier exam, there are two ways of dealing with it, which give the same answer. Uh, and if you um, study the previous paper with me, you'll know for the previous exam, generally the most efficient way was to calculate the tax on the operating profit itself and separately the tax saving from these allowances. Now, you can do that here. However, in this exam, for reasons I will explain later, it's generally safer to take the other approach. But what we're going to do, we've got the operating profit. We're now going to calculate the taxable profit, so we can calculate the tax. And to get the taxable profit, we subtract the tax allowable depreciation or the capital allowances. I say again, two things mean the same. Tax allowable depreciation, same thing. Now you'll always be told the rules for calculating the capital allowances, but uh, we are going to need separate workings. So here's my capital allowance calculations. 
It's 25% reducing balance. So we start with the original cost, and given I'm working to the nearest thousand, second line says the cost was 1.8 million. The allowances, per the question, 25% reducing balance. So in the first year, we'll be entitled to charge 25%, we call it the writing down allowance, but the word doesn't matter, but 25% of 1,800 is 450. So we're allowed to charge that in arriving at the profit for tax purposes. I'll go back to the original table after, but let's finish this bit. But that brings the written down value down to 1350. So in the second year, it's 25% of 1350, which is how much? 337. It doesn't matter whether you round up or down. Roundings don't matter for the exam. But that brings us down to 1013. So in the third year, 25% of 1013 is 253, bringing us down to 760. And in the fourth year, I hope I'm right, but I expended a minute, I've got a nice little check on myself later. 25% of 760 is 190, bringing us down to 570. Now we carry on like that every year until the final year. And in the final year, which here is uh, the fifth year, we don't get writing down allowance. Uh, instead, what we do is we subtract the scrap proceeds, which here, third line of the question, a thousand. And the difference, which here is 430, I hope, is either a balancing allowance or a balancing charge. And to explain the logic, although rules are rules, obviously, the point is, you see, that the tax authorities uh, in total will allow us to charge the difference between the original cost and the sale proceeds. We buy for 18, we sell for 1,000, so in total, we're allowed allowances of 800. How many allowances had we been given? Well, it was 450, then it was another 337, then it was another 253, then it was another 190. So we've had doom, 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 a total of 1230 of allowances, which is too much. We're only allowed 800 in total, and so we've had 430 too much. And so, in fact, we'll have a balancing charge of 430. Uh, so instead of reducing the taxable profit, as it, they would in the previous years, here in the fifth year, we'll have to increase the taxable profit by uh, that 430. Uh, just a quick way, you can actually save a bit of time. I don't want to waste your time here, it doesn't matter, but obviously speed matters in the exam. Is when you've got the situation that you've got here uh, of 25% reducing balance, which is usually the situation in the exam, then in fact, once you've worked out the first allowance of 450, what's left is 75%, you're taking 25% of it. Well, the next allowance should be 75% at 450. What is it? 450 times 
337. The next ion should be 75% of 337. What is it? 253. The next ion should be 75% of 253. Ah, 190. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to waste your time, but obviously speed matters. You've got to be able to get that out quick. Anyway, having uh, worked out as workings what our allowances are, for tax purposes, year one, reduce the tax or profit by 450, year two, three, three, seven. Uh, year three, 253 and then 190. And year five, for the reasons I explained, instead of reducing taxable profit, we've got this balancing charge. We need to increase the taxable profit. So that gives taxable profits Uh, our first year, a loss of 49. I'll come back to that and discuss it in a minute. But arithmetically, in the second year, 435 minus 337, 98. Third year, 472 minus 253 is 219. 511 minus 190 is 321. Uh, and in the fifth year, 554 plus 430 is 984. So those are the taxable profits. Now we can work out the tax. And tax obviously is a cash flow, uh, which needs bringing in. Uh, now, in that first year, we've got negative 49. It looks like a loss, but be very careful here. How we deal with it depends on the wording of the question. Here, Rome is thinking of buying a new machine. So presumably, Rome already exists. And we always assume that they're currently making profits and therefore currently paying tax. What's the effect of doing this project going to have? This project loses 49 in the first year. Well, as far as the company's concerned, on the assumption I said, that 49 will reduce the profit they're already making. And as a result, they'll save some tax from what they're already paying. And so that 49 will simply save tax at, what's the rate, 25%. And so effectively, if we're saving tax, effectively it's like an inflow, less tax payable, effectively an inflow as far as this project is concerned. All right, be careful in the exam. If it was the case, for example, that Rome was setting up a new company in a foreign country, uh, then, of course, that, the foreign country will be taxed all by itself. And here, then, if they made a loss in the first year, as they do here, there'd be no tax payable. But when we calculated the tax of the second year, we'd subtract that loss and work out the tax on the lower figure. Now, I'll illustrate that in um, a later example. But I hope I've made it clear, it depends very much on the wording of the question. Uh, if here, I already explained that, so in future years, um, we've got extra profits, sex or tax or profits, so we'll be paying tax. So 98 times 25%. An outflow of 24, 25. Uh, in the next year, 219 times 25%, 55. Uh, 321 times 25%, 80. And finally, 984 times 25%, 246. Uh, check the timing. Here it said 
uh, tax payable immediately. And so we've worked out the taxable profits each year, calculated the tax payable in the same year. Um, the other common alternative is taxes payable one year in arrears, one year later. If that was the case, that 12 would be at time 2, that 24 would be at time 3, and so on, one year later. Which is why you could have needed a, a sixth year. However, uh, not here. However, uh, if we deal with tax this way, which I say it in this exam is the better way, we've worked out the tax, which is a cash flow, as are labour materials revenue. But the capital allowances were only there for the calculation of tax. They're not an actual cash flow. We're not actually paying out allowances of 45337 and so on. And so to get back to cash flows, we now need to add back the capital allowances. Again, they were only subtracted in order to calculate tax. So to cancel those outflows, add back 450, add back 337, add back 253, 190. And of course the 430, the other way around, we'd added it to calculate tax. Again, there's no cash flow, so subtract it. All right, we're nearly there, but what else? We've now dealt with the operating flows and the tax on them. Of course, there are other flows. First of all, there's the original cost. It was 1.8 million. That's payable immediately times zero. There's also the scrap proceeds themselves. That's a cash receipt. Uh, a million at time five. And finally, the last line of the question before the tax rules. There's working capital. But, you know, we're doing a new, we're buying a new machine, we're producing a new product, so we're going to need to carry extra inventories, extra receivables, etc. Uh, and it tells us we need another 200,000 at the start of the project. But remember, we always assume that any working capital is needed for the life of the machine. But at the end of its life, here in five years, it's no longer required, and therefore we get it back. And, of course, there's no tax effect. Just buy more inventory, there's no tax effect. So that's why it was left at the end. Now, again, you'll see in later examples, there's something else that can make it a bit more complicated for you. Uh, it may be that more working capital is needed during the life of the project. But again, that doesn't make it harder. It just keeps adding on more work, more time pressure. All right, I've now got all the cash flows, and so now let's get the net cash flow each year. At time zero, an outflow of 2,000. At time one, it was minus 49 plus 12 plus 450. It was 413 inflow. At time two, 98 minus 24 plus 337. 411. At time four, three, two, one, eighty, one, ninety, four, three, one. And finally, at time five, nine, eight, four, minus two, four, six, minus four, thirty, plus twelve hundred, one, five, zero, eight. And finally, of course, having got the cash flows, all that remains is to discount at the cost of capital. 
Uh, and this hardly carries any marks because this really is the most basic bit of all. Uh, remember, there would have been marks for calculating the cost of capital, but the actual discounting is trivial. Uh, multiply by the discount factors at what rate is it to 10%? Always write that down. You could have misread the question, you could have made a mistake in calculating cost of capital. Uh, you don't lose marks twice. So even if you'd calculated it wrong and got 12%, you would get full marks here uh, for discounting at 12. Anyway, we checked the discounting before uh, when we were looking at cost of redeemable debt. Uh, the discount factors from the tables, uh, times zero is one. Um, one year, 0 0.909, 2, 0 0.826, 0 0.751, 0 0.683, 0 0.621. And therefore the present values multiply by the discount factors. Uh, 413 times 0 0.909 is 375. 411 times 0.26, 339, 417 times 0.751, 313. There are the present values, and finally, of course, in order to actually make the decision, we need to calculate the net present value, uh, which is 375 plus 339 plus 313 plus 294 936 uh, minus 2000. Uh, I get plus. 258. Um, of course, 1,000. Remember, everything we were working in thousands. And our decision, the most basic thing of all, since the MPV is positive, we would accept the project. Subject, of course, in real life to the accuracy of all the estimates we've used. Had it been negative, we would reject the project. But there is the net value. You're paying out 2000 to get something, to get a project with a value of 2258 The net value is positive. There we go. All right, well, I said at the beginning uh, that all of that was really revision of the sorts of things you got asked in the earlier financial management paper. Everything I've said there remains relevant for this exam, but I've already mentioned one or two, but in this exam there can be more complications brought in and much more to read. Well, I'll deal with all of them in the later lectures. I said I was going to split this chapter up into several because um, otherwise it gets too long. So I'll leave that there. However, do keep hold of your figures for that because in the next lecture um, I'm going to use the same question, the same figures, to do a few extra things. Good.